I'm Mike. And I'm Matt. And this is The Coin Show. On this episode of The Coin Show, Matt talks to us about shield nickels. I'll bring a book recommendation, this time talking about modern U.S. coins. And we'll talk about the coolest thing to walk into Matt's shop this week. But first, as always, the news. The news. Sharpen your numismatic skills by taking the American Numismatic Association School of Numismatics Educational Two-Day Seminars, held prior to the 60th Annual Fund Convention in Orlando, Florida. Fundamentals of Grading U.S. Coins and Introduction to Counterfeit Detection of United States Coins will be held on Tuesday and Wednesday, January 6th and 7th. Tuition for the seminars is $248 for ANA and Fund members and $348 for non-members. For more information and to register online, go to money.org. Matt, a couple of days ago, October 28th, as this show Mm -hmm. is airing, uh, it'll be, it's a couple of days from now, but when this airs, it'll be a couple of days ago. The United States Mint opened sales of the 50th anniversary Kennedy Silver Set. Hmm. Now, have you seen this set? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've I've seen them. Of the sets that they've brought out in the last couple of years. When I first saw this set, I was kind of like, eh, yeah, whatever, it's a Kennedy set, no big deal, you know. And the closer it gets, the more I kind of like it, and, you know, there's a couple of reasons for it. Have you ever seen a 2014 Kennedy half? Oh, of course. Well, I mean, besides an immense set, no. Okay. The circulation strike coins are struck like the normal circulation strike coins, and the relief on them is relatively flat. The special set coins for this year are being struck from special dies, which have the original 1964 relief. Okay. So, so you'll actually be able to tell the difference between the P and D from the sets, the specimen coins, and the circulation strikes, which I think is kind of cool and a little unnecessary. But, I mean, it's, it's just something different. Something different. That's right. Yeah, and different is always good. Now, the four-coin sets mintage is limited to 300,000 sets. And I anticipate that this set will sell out. I think it probably will, sure. Included in this set is going to be a reverse proof coin, which is going to be struck at San Francisco. Okay. A proof coin struck at Philadelphia, which is kind of neat because that harkens back to the original 64 Kennedy proof, which was also struck at Philadelphia. But this one will have a P-mint mark. Mm -hmm. A reverse proof coin, which is going to be struck at West Point. And a regular uncirculated coin, an uncirculated finished coin struck at Denver. So those are your four finishes. They're all going to be made in four different places. But all of them will have the the special higher relief, reminiscent of the 1964 coin. Yeah, sure. Coinnews.net posted a map of the, the enhanced uncirculated dollar as to where exactly the laser treatments are going to be on this coin. Now... One of, one of the things that I like on this is that they give you a color map, right, where they show you, uh, a, and uh, should uh, there's a link on our Facebook page, I want to say, that I posted on Sunday of this last week. So you can go back and look on our Facebook page, and you can see a copy of the map that they give you. But the way the coinnews.net describes it is that fields shown in yellow receive a special wire brushing technique. So that's going to be the, it's going to be kind of mirrored, but it's that kind of dull mirror. And the other colors represent varying intensity of laser applications. 
blue shows to regions of standard or modern laser frosting, which is what the frosting that we're, we're used to seeing on typical proof coins. Mm-hmm. And white represents uh, the use of laser polishing. And that's going to be the, it's going to be the stars on the coin. And then you're going to have uh, the gray areas of the coin are going to be just regular circulation strike mirrored finishes. It's, it's interesting because the eagle is going to have, it, he's going to have laser polishing on everything but his, his white top, his white uh, neck and head and his mm-hmm. tail feathers, which is going to be kind of cool looking. And yeah. the uh, laser polishing on the stars is going to differentiate them from the rest of that eagle. And then the front. <laughs> well, in the front, the front is going to kind of look like a proof coin, yeah. if you ask me. I mean, it's but what I what I love about this is that they show purple indicates areas of heavy laser frosting. Now I've been looking at this map all day, <laughs> and I don't see any purple on it. Uh, yeah, I don't see any either. So, uh, I don't know. <laughs> in, in my opinion, okay, it it the. The enhanced and circulated finish was something that was, it was just absolutely, it was made a star by the Walking Liberty design. Mm-hmm. Because there are so many things in that design that you can highlight. And when you look at the reverse of the of the enhanced and circulated Silver Eagle, yeah, you see the shield a little bit better on the Eagle and that kind of stuff. But, I mean, there was nothing really impressive about it. Whereas, when you go to the obverse of the coin, you actually see the flag. Which is something that in none of the versions that they've done before... Have you really been able to see, in in all its old glory, to throw a pun at you? <laughs> you know, so so I mean, it really made the flag the star of that coin. Yeah, and I just don't know where they're going to go with that finish to make it. The shield is going to be the star of this coin. Okay, I hope so. <laughs> you know, but the shield is going to have the same finish as as, as the field. I know. I'm just saying so, it'll look nice and stripy. Yeah, it will look stripy and it'll look cool. And it'll be frosty and stripy. Yep. So those were, those were the two was... uh, dwarves they kicked out. Frosty and stripy. <laughs> stripy and was frosty. always in jail, and Frosty just liked a cold mug. Yes, he did. <laughs> God bless him. Then he went and had a kid. Yeah. A snowman. <laughs> frosty Jr. Oh, Lord. <sighs> Uh, but uh, Coin News Net has a map posted of the coins laser treatments for those who'd like a sneak peek, or if you want to, you can go back to our Facebook page and you can look and you can find it there. In a previously unprecedented move, the Deputy Director of the United States Mint, because we don't have a Director of the United States Mint currently, Richard Peterson has distributed 35 2015 three-coin U.S. Marshals 225th anniversary commemorative coins I read right this. now in 2014. I read this. I think this is the first time we've ever done this. You know, I I honestly thought that it was the first time we've ever done it. And the, the literature that I've read on it only says that NGC believes it's the first time. I'd go out on a limb and say that it likely is. Yeah. This was something that was that was actually authorized in the legislation for the coin. So it's not like they're breaking any laws here, but they are doing something incredibly different in issuing a 2015 coin in 2014. And I guess maybe where where you got to be careful how you word that is if you think about the bicentennial coins they had a date of 1976 on them and they were actually released in 1975. Yeah. So maybe that's why they stepped around it the way that they did. Yeah, that but, was the one that I could think of that was like, eh, maybe, but... Yeah, but but um, this is a 2015 coin, and it's a 2015 commemorative coin. It's not going to be available until next year. Um, but, you know, you're, he's he has issued 35 of them, distributed 35 of the sets, which consisted of a $5 gold piece, a silver dollar coin, and your favorite... A clad half dollar. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder, so, you know what's really cool? I, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about this. I'm wondering if what what if they uh, they do some minute design changes between now and the time they actually issue them, and these 35 sets end up being something like the Cheerios dollar, where they have some different part of the design that they ended up going with. It would not surprise me. It would really not take all that much for it to occur because i mean, well, I mean they probably have only now in the time they release them i mean it's gonna be what like six or eight months well not only that but 
they likely have not produced all the dyes for these coins yet. Oh, yeah. I agree. And as long as there are dyes that need to be produced, the possibility of something going horribly awry, <laughs> they're there. They're going to present themselves. And we may have something that is exactly, as you said, mirrors the, the, Cheerios, uh, the Cheerios dollars, which are identifiable you know, by the tail. Yep. The, by completely the, by different the... than all the rest of the coins that were made. So I'm just, yep. you know, I'm wondering if maybe they don't go back and do something like that. Not, you know, obviously not on purpose, but you know, it would, right. It would, but... Once they come out, it would be worth checking. Yeah. And, and it might also put a really high premium on these 35 sets, which, yeah. you know, these were distributed to members of the U S marshals and, you know, thank them for the service and all that kind of stuff. To be honest with you, if somebody's going to benefit like that clandestinely, I'd much sooner it be somebody like the U.S. Marshals. Yeah. Well, and the thing, I think they're not allowed to sell them. I think they've been been barred from selling their pre- presentation pieces until the actual issuance of the regular commemoratives. Oh, no, see, that was something I was completely yeah, unaware of. I, re- I had read that. Now, I find it also interesting that... Uh, NGC has received at least two of these sets, which they have graded and encapsulated with a special pedigree, noting that they're coins from the celebration ceremony with labels featuring the date of September 24th, 2014. Mm, don't get me started on that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's that's plastic and all that kind of stuff. But that's but for what I'm episode. saying is that. But what I'm saying is is that um, they they have been noted that these coins are different. And, you know, they've already graded. <laughs> they've already graded some of these coins. Yeah, yeah. And the the set that is up on coinnews.net has the clad half dollar is a is an ultra uh, proof 70 ultra cameo. The five dollar gold piece is a proof 70 ultra cameo. And the silver dollar is a proof 69. Yeah. Well, not unusual. Well, you, you'd think the silver one would strike up better. I don't know. I guess. If it, I, I, my, my initial thought would be that the clad one would be the one that ended up 69, but yeah. well, what do I know? You never know with these things, with the modern, modern submissions. Yes. Um, you know, we got a, I think it was a, a, a Facebook friend this week. One? Well, no, but I mean, it, who actually voiced his opinion <laughs> that, you know, he, he was really glad that we were back, but he said, God, you guys talk about the U.S. Mint too much. It's like, <laughs> it's like, dude, you know, this is the coin show is all about United States coins. I mean, yes, we venture off, you know, into foreign and, and ancient and stuff like that. But, I mean, we kind of stick with, you know. Hey, we, we've showed our love for the World Canadian Mint over, over the last couple of years. Yes, so. and we've also talked about, you know, coins of, of different, you know, places around the world. But primarily, you know, my news is going to revolve around U.S. coins and releases, and I try to cover other places around the world as much as the news, you know, surfaces. And so with that said, <laughs> the Royal Canadian Mint, uh-huh. our America's hat. I see where you were going uh, there. Yes, has released another new idea in silver coinage. There's another one that you're going to absolutely love. Uh, <laughs> sure. Uh, according to coinnews.net, the $20 Venetian glass snowman silver coin. What? Yes, it's it's a 2014 $20 silver coin, and it features a 3D Venetian glass snowman. So if you lay this coin down on it on Queen Elizabeth's face, okay, <laughs> the you won't be able to stack these coins because there is a Venetian glass snowman like that, that is it? set it's set on the field. Huh. Now, I would I would imagine that it was something that is post strike. But I'm not entirely sure how they're I've created. I gotta think so. Yes, but uh, it, you know, it's the coin is struck from an ounce of pure ninety nine ninety nine silver, and features a snowman created by master glassmakers in Murano, Italy. Yeah, so it must have been done separately. Yes. Now, the Royal Canadian Mint goes on to say that Venetian glass is prized around the world for its clear, vibrant colors. Because it is handcrafted by skilled artisans, each glass snowman on each coin is unique. Uh, so they're all a little bit different. Uh, man. <laughs> I, I know. This, this kind of smacks to me of the 
of the coins with the jewels on them. Yeah, I like a lot gems. of the stuff that the Royal Canadian Mint does, but I don't like this a bit. I think well, it's pokey. I, I knew that you wouldn't like this, but I only like it because I like the color, and I like the design in general. Yeah. I like the fact that they used they used the frosted part of the design for snow, and uh, it, well, the coin is colorful, but with a U. Yeah. Colorful. <laughs> And dresses as snowman in a green scarf, a black top hat, red buttons, and an orange nose. A Christmas tree complete with ornaments and lights bring more color to this beautiful holiday coin. And for those who think that the uh, Royal Canadian Mint is overdoing this stuff, me, like me, you, yeah, sales would suggest otherwise. The coin is limited to a mintage of 10,000 coins and nearly 90% sold out already. <sighs> It is absolutely amazing to me. That, look, here's the way I feel about, about being on the edge of the cutting edge of something. Is some of the stuff is going to be right in the sweet spot. Some of it's going to fall short. Some of it's going to be like way over the top. Yeah, this one's way over the top. And, and I can't really disagree with you too much. I'm sorry. This just but, reinforces my dislike of modern coins. Well, that, to be honest with you, I, I don't disagree with you. I think that this one is a little over the line, but it's a pretty coin. And had they had they used a colorized uh, had they used a colorized version of it, I thought the coin would be beautiful without the glass, without the Venetian glass. But once again, I will at least salute the Royal Canadian Mint for trying and trying different things. And constantly trying to improve. I'll give you that. Okay? Like it or don't, you know, and you clearly don't. <laughs> not, I'm not a huge fan, but I like the fact that they're always bringing something different. Yes, that is true. Now, along the lines of not doing something different, <laughs> the United States Mint, on the flip side of that, uh -oh. has released its sixth and final Platinum Eagle Proof Coin in the Preamble Series. October 20th. Mint News Blog is reporting that the theme for this year's coin is to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. It's, it's the end of the preamble to the Constitution. Hmm. Mintage for this coin has been set at 15,000 coins. Now, this is what I mean about, you know, the Royal Canadian Mint is trying and they're doing different stuff. And a lot of times when the U.S. Mint tries this stuff, it just kind of rings flat. Well, you know, they, I'll they, tell you that they, I like this design a lot better than I like that last one. So. Well, yes, because this is a coin, not a studded coin or whatever you want to call this. And, and it's made out of pure platinum, yeah. which is... It has nothing you know, to do with that. Just, I just okay. like the design better. You know, the, the, the U.S. Mint started in 2009 with to form a more perfect union. 2010 to establish justice, you know, and they keep on going through the preamble. To date, sales of these coins have been disappointing, and none of the coins in this series have sold out. And yet, they continue to make them every year. And this is what I mean by, you know, the Royal Canadian Mint makes makes a relatively small mintage of these and seems to sell them out. And they they don't um, they they don't always necessarily do things that appeal to everybody, but. By the same token, if you look at their sales, they sell out of stuff. This Platinum Eagle mintage for this year's proof coin is limited to 15,000 coins. Well, I got, I'm sorry to say it like this, I've got news for you, okay? Last year's coin saw sales closed on March 12 of this year with a disappointing 5,745 coins sold. Yeah, well, I think it's cost prohibitive, really. I mean, you know, not everybody has the 16 or 1,700 bucks to plop down on. On a, on a coin like this every then, year. Then don't make a max minage of 15,000 coins. Well, that, that's between you and the U.S. Mint, my friend. Well, I guess. Letter. Write them a letter. Yeah, sure, they're going to listen to me. Hey. Especially as I bash them on my show every week. Well, maybe but maybe I, that's why they would listen to you. Just well, saying. maybe maybe I should take the shillelagh to them. <laughs> you know, I, I, I guess my thing is just that, that they keep creating these series of coins. And then the series are abysmal failures, and then they have to continue striking them. Speaking you know, of like, which. <laughs> well, yes. You know, but but uh, the last note on this is this is mercifully, 
the final coin in the series. Yeah. Now, I also wrote in my notes, do Platinum Eagles have much demand? Not really. I mean, we hardly ever see them in the store, and I, I get zero phone calls about them. So. Aren't you glad that they never minted the Palladium Eagle that they were talking you about? Know, I actually would have liked the Palladium Eagle. I think that that coin, um, because of its lower price point, would have been a better seller. But that's just me. Okay, but I think that this is a perfect example of how, as you start getting away from your basic gold and silver, you start diversifying your audience too much, and you just can't find the demand for what you're producing. That's probably just true. One man's opinion. Yep. And finally, speaking of mercifully, speaking. in the news, finally in the news, <laughs> you may have seen this little tidbit on our Facebook page last week also, but the maximum minages for the Jackie Kennedy first spouse coin will be raised to 30,000 coins. That's going to be a popular one. I expect that the coin will actually sell out as the popularity of Jacqueline Kennedy still resonates in the United States. Well, and plus you have the Kennedy gold this year and the Jacqueline, you know, the JFK gold and the Jacqueline gold, you know. You know, that's an interesting. Set. That's interesting because prior to this the only husband wife team on on gold coins were George and Martha. Yeah. You know, and now you have Camelot. You know, so um all of the other 2015's first spouse coins will be limited to 10,000 coins, and I think that that's appropriate. You know, but this may be the most popular coin of the entire first spouse series, and it, I think a lot of that is due to the fact that that collectors of my age, you know, a little bit older uh, collectors, you know, we remember JFK, yeah, or at least we were part of that era, and. You know, the impact that his assassination had on our country and, and you know, um, and the way that we felt about that first family has made them just really strong people in our in our remembrance of history. Yeah. So, you know, I'm I'm actually surprised that they didn't go with the maximum set in the original legislation of 40,000 coins. Well, you know, I think they'd sell them. And. Here you go with, you know, it's like you, you, you've got a 15,000 minage for this Platinum Eagle at 1600 bucks, and you're only going to make 30,000 of a Jack D. Kennedy coin that likely is going to sell out. Yeah. So. Well, I think you need to go be the mint director. Just saying. Mike Nottleman for mint director. <laughs> mint, Mike Nottleman, mint director. We, I, I'll tell you what. It has a nice ring to it. It does have a nice ring to it. Mike Nottleman, super cheap. No, that's <laughs> You can find these and other news stories from the coin world on our website at coinshowradio.com. Just click on news on the top bar for our RSS news feed. You know, Matt, yes, sir. Uh, in one of the earlier episodes of the coin show, mm -hmm. you talked about what started your love of coin collecting. Yeah. And that would be the two cent piece. Mm -hmm. And at least from my research, the coin that you're going to talk about tonight yeah. has the exact same design on it. Uh, funny you say that. It sure does. This episode, I wanted to talk about shield nickels. They're not my favorite classic American coin, but, you know, they do deserve... Some coverage, at least on our show. <laughs> well, they started the entire nickel yeah. yep. craze. They were the first copper nickel five cent piece mm -hmm. that was made by our country. They were the first official nickel, and they were only minted in Philadelphia. Oh, and I got one more fun fact for you. Okay. They were also the first metric coin made by the United States Mint. Oh, yeah, that, that's right. Five grams. Yep. Yep. Funny you mentioned that, too. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't want to steal your thunder. Go no, 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 that's okay. The Coinage Act of May 16, 1866, specifically authorized the type of coin to be struck in 75% copper and 25% nickel, which was the composition that these coins maintained. The coin came about right after the Civil War, which saw fairly successful use of base metal coins as circulating currency. The Flying Eagle Cent and the Indian Cent of 1859 to 1864 were issued in copper nickel, and people readily spent them during the economic crisis caused by the war. And 
the idea of this base metal currency continues to this day, actually, uh, because as, as you're very familiar with, our coins now are base metal. You know, it, it's funny because up until the point of the Flying Eagle scent, all of our coins were basically worth their weight in whatever metal they were made out of. And the Flying Eagle scent was kind of an experiment of, you know, will they go with it? Yep. Will, will the public accept it? And as I remember, I think it was last week or last episode, we had a listener question that it asked about, you know, five cent silver and five cent nickel, why they manufactured them. And, you know, you would, you made the comment that these were only minted in Philadelphia and basically they only circulated in the East. That was my next point, actually. Uh, I'm reading your notes, aren't I? Yeah, I think you are, actually. That's the funny part. <laughs> yeah, that that's actually... Uh, a fun fact about shield nickels that they, is that they actually circulated alongside half dimes till 1873. You know, as as Mike just spoke about, because people on the East Coast tended to be more acceptant of base metal currency, whereas people on the West Coast wanted hard currency, silver and gold. So they actually minted both shield nickels and half dimes at the same time to be used in different parts of the country. The coin itself was designed by James Longacre. Uh, it features a shield of the Union on the obverse, which is an important design during the Civil War era. They're the winners. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> and <clears throat> that's funny. Uh, and as you mentioned, it does share the same, uh, same design with the two-cent piece as well. The reverse features 13 stars to represent the original 13 colonies. Uh, and the number five prominently featured in the center of the design to designate, obviously, that it's five cents. The first two years of the design featured the rays on the reverse, and 19th century numismatists called this the stars and bars variety. Mint director Snowden believed that the rays were detrimental to dye life in the coining process, uh, so they had them removed in 1868. Now, I, I was going to comment on that, actually, because I think probably one of the coolest designs of all time is the is it was it the seated that had the arrows and rays reversed? Yes. Yes. And I, I thought that that was just a design that was really, really super cool. And it came long before, you know, the shield nickels. Mm -hmm. And I think that somebody must have really liked it to kind of pay homage to it with this coin. Well and, and the funny thing is the exact same reason that they uh <laughs> that they uh, they took him off the seated coinage was the reason that they took him off the shield nickels because it uh, made the dyes not last as long because there was so much going on. Yeah, you'd think that they'd have seen that one coming because if you're having a problem with dye life on a silver coin, yeah, uh, the the hard hard nickel. Yeah, think about striking it in nickel. It's yeah. got to be just impossible. Yep. And a little bit of basic collecting information about these coins is shield nickels circulated at a time when a nickel was actually a pretty handy amount of money. Uh, this compares to, yeah, between a 5 and a $10 bill of purchasing power today in the 19th century. So it's not surprising that these coins were the workhorse of the Victorian economy. And the vast majority of the coins that survive today are very heavily worn. So these were a coin that, that were readily accepted, they were readily traded, and people apparently seemed to like them. Yeah, yeah, they, they did circulate very heavily. A, a full set, including major varieties, includes a whopping 19 coins. But this includes some very popular overdates that are expensive in pretty much any grade. Nonetheless, the full set is very achievable, and actually, in lower grades, uh, you know, it can be had for not a ton of money. Um, whereas higher grade coins, you know, it, it, just like any coin, the higher the grade you get, the more money it's going to cost. Um, now I know in the in the series that immediately follows these, the Liberty Head nickels, mm -hmm. there are several years that they were made in proof only. It, it, is that the case with shield nickels are, as well? There are a couple of proof only years. Uh, that would be 1877 and 1878 would be the, the two proof only years and they have a mintage of 1250 and 2350 coins respectively that would make them the quote keys yeah they're the key dates but but i mean even for for old proof coins 1250 is still a pretty decent mintage which means you can probably you can find them because you know these coins were were sent to collectors and most of them stayed in fairly decent shape mm -hmm. and stayed in collections so 
a, a couple of other cool facts about shield nickels is that type collectors like them as well because there are two different types. You have the obviously we we've talked about the uh, stars and bars, stars and bars, and then you have just the the plain reverse. Another interesting thing about shield nickels is for some reason shield nickels come with a variety of minting defects or varieties. As many as one in four total coins will exhibit some sort of mint defect from repunched dates to double dies to um, minor die varieties. Uh, and for some dates, like 1868, which is the most common date of the set, they've actually cataloged over 150 different varieties. Wow. Just in one year. So this is a, a die variety or the the person that likes to study die varieties, this is like a like a the promised land for them. Mm-hmm, exactly. Um so it it's it's one of those that you know, if you like die varieties, it's very possible that you'll be able to find them on these particular coins easily and probably not have to pay a premium for them. Yeah, there's there's an education that can be had in this series all by itself. Yep. Now, like many coins during that period, quality is rather elusive when it comes to these coins. A lot of the times you see them, they are unevenly struck, uh, weakly struck, and just not, in general, made very well. Uh, so this can make finding higher and uncirculated coins hard because a lot of the times the coins didn't even come out of the mint in in you know, MS-63 or MS-64 condition. So it, it f- makes finding choice high-end examples very hard. Now, I kind of wanted to run through some of the date highlights uh, of this particular set. You have, obviously, we talked about the first coin, the 1866 with Rays. This was the first year for the Shield Nickels, as we said, and the design was very rough on the dies. So finding nicely struck examples is very hard to do i think the total survival rate of uncirculated coins is guesstimated at around three thousand pieces total with an original mintage of 14 million coins and as we talked about earlier the 1877 and 78 are the proof only issues and actually our friend q david bowers says that they can be bought with some regularity due to the fact that these coins move in and out of investment portfolios relatively often just because this is a coin that like we said earlier was available and still is available to buy they're they're not cheap but you can find them i find it incredibly interesting that they started minting this coin as an alternative to a you know to another coin of the same value Mm -hmm. in the mid 1860s and to this date that same denomination is still minted on the exact same size planchet in the exact same material. Yeah, that is interesting. It, throughout all the, the years and all the inflation and, you know, even the scent has been changed a couple of times to have something that, you know, is still made the exact same way as it was in the mid-1860s. It's kind of fascinating. It, it is kind of interesting, isn't it? And just, I, I would be doing this set a disservice if I did not talk about the one overdate in the series, which is the 1883 over two. In this coin, their estimated survival is about 300 pieces in all grades. Um, and there are five known die varieties in 1883 that show some sort of overdate from 1882. The FS. 013 is the most valuable, as it is one of the most clear overdates. And it also is kind of neat because they really didn't discover it until the 1960s. So at that time, magazines kind of picked it up in the 60s, and there was kind of the, the, the rush to find these coins out there once it was discovered. But yeah, that's that's the, the 1883 over 2 that everybody's looking for. Uh, you know, if you're doing the set, it's a hard coin to find. I can say I've never even owned one. Hmm. You've never owned a shield nickel? I've never owned an 1883 over 2 shield. Oh, okay. The the FS zero uh, thirteen, which is the tough one. That's the tough one. There are, there are a lot of blob, like a lot of filled dies and die chips that kind of look like overdates on that particular eighteen eighty three. But there's really only five that are actually five die pairs that are actually true overdates, and then that one die pair, uh, the zero thirteen, is the tough one. Wow! So they they have it nailed down to a, a specific pair of dies, and kind of like your your twenty two no D. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a specific pair of dies, and that's the one that's the, all worth all the money. Yep, and then there is a good book out there on them. It's a guidebook of shield nickels and Liberty Head nickels by Q. David Bowers, which was put out by Whitman Publishing, I believe, in 2006 or 2007. So I think you can still get them 
I own a copy of that book. There you go. It's a good book. I, I From uh, what I hear, I don't have one, but it is a good book. Yeah, it's part of the Red Book series. And uh, I have to say that every single one of those books, Bowers kind of goes through year by year, and he describes what you know what the world was like at that time, and then what to look for in the coins. He also describes what to look for in a good coin, you know, and what is the the better characteristics of the more collectible versions. Hmm, that's cool. Yeah, that's yeah. definitely useful if you're collecting a certain series. So check it out. Thanks to the friends, to our friends, the Coffin Cats. You know, I'm wearing my Coffin Cats t-shirt. Are you? Right. Yes, yes, I am. I don't even have I, one. So I love this shirt. They don't make them in fat guy sizes. Yeah, they do. Stop it. They, you know what? we got to get them to send it. we got to actually, we've got to send them a couple of coin show t-shirts. Oh, we have to have them. You know what the problem is? Is I didn't give them to them because they were medium and small. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. And it's like, and, and Eric, who is the drummer. From Coffee Cats, he's this big guy. He's a big I mean, fella, he's, yeah. I've met he's him. not a small dude, no. and it's like, and, and I'm like, okay, well, what t- what size T-shirt do you wear? He's like medium. <laughs> okay, should have gave him yeah, medium because he, he's gonna. I don't have any mediums. Uh, All I had was large, extra large, and we got fat guy sizes made in our <laughs> shirts, but they didn't get them made in their shirts. <laughs> now <laughs> uh, no, it's my turn to have a fit. Yeah, we love the Coffee Cats, though. We do. So. The holidays are coming, yes, and every year, about this time, I start thinking about you know holiday gift ideas, and you know with the new website up, I need to bring more recommendations for books. Get on it, man! You've got a whole yes. section of the website dedicated to no- nothing but. We have a brand new section of our brand new website that is Mike's book recommendations, and this week I have one for you. Awesome, because. Whitman has just released a new third edition of the 100 Greatest U.S. Modern Coins. Oh, this book's straight up your alley. Yes, this this is, if if you wanted to put a book that has Mike written all over it, <laughs> in the wheel, this is it. This is it. This is right in my joy spot. Now, coin collecting is a hobby that lends itself well to many different levels of interest, and in particular, the collecting of contemporary coins appeals to many people because it allows them entry into this hobby of kings at a more modest level of investment. Hobby of serfs. Yes, that, that's <laughs> more me. Typically me considered too. to be... Yeah, right. Typically considered to be a hobby gateway. The collecting of coins from 1963 to the present day allows many numismatists to assemble sets from more readily available sources, such as the annual sets sold by the United States Mint, or even from their own pocket change. But as this era is now growing past 50 years in length, it is becoming a larger and larger piece of the whole American coinage history. So an increasing number of these coins from the modern era are prized at higher levels of collecting, including your level, (laughs) <laughs> thus integrating these entry-level collectors into the mainstream of numismatics. Whitman Publishing has recognized this growing sector of the hobby and has showcased coins of varying levels in their 100 Greatest Library. You know, Books featuring ancient as well as American coins, paper money, stamps, medals and tokens, error coins, military photographs, and even firearms. Hmm. There's, a, there's a 100 Greatest Firearms. They appeal to a broad array of collectors and interests. Now, most recently, Whitman has released a third edition of 100 Greatest U.S. Modern Coins by Scott Schechter and Jeff Garrett, highlighting coins from the era of 1963 to present. Changes made to this newest edition are important as the authors have considered the ability to own these coins as criteria for their inclusion. You know, this is not to say that this edition could be retitled 100 Greatest Common Coins, yeah. because many of the top listings are highly sought after and seldom seen rarities. But a distinct difference from earlier versions is the elimination of coins that are illegal to own, like the 1974 aluminum cent, hmm. the 2000 W Sacagawea dollar struck in gold, and the 1964 D Peace dollar, which all were listed 
in the 100 Greatest uh, Modern Coins earlier editions. Author Scott Schechter says, we decided that all of the coins on this list should be collectible. Potentially illegal coins are not. Now, although I consider stories of these coins to be important and an interesting part of the rich fabric of our hobby, I also believe that any ranking of the greatest coins should be worthy of pursuit, and completing the set should be, at a minimum, of you know attainable. Yeah, that's a good point. Some true rarities that likely should not exist are included, such as the 1964 Special Mint Set coins. I've seen one of those. Those are cool. They are really cool, and... People didn't know they existed for a long time. Yep. Yep. Or the Extra Leaf Wisconsin Statehood Quarters. Interesting coins. But not all of the coins on the list are devoid of precious metal content. Bullion coins like the 2013 W Reverse Proof Buffalo Gold $50 coin. And the 2006 W Reverse Proof Gold American Eagle. Coin varieties like the 2007 W Platinum Eagle with the Frosted Freedom. Mm-hmm. From America. America. <laughs> and silver offerings like the 1995 W Proof Coin. Possibly the king of the Silver American Eagles. Oh, there is no possibly. As well as its crown prince, the 2013 W Enhanced Uncirculated Silver Eagle. One of my favorites. Yeah. More readily available coins have made the list as well. From the 1996 W Roosevelt Dime and the 1982 Washington Commemorative Half Dollar to the 1983 P. Washington Quarter. Hmm, interesting. Very, very common coin, but not in super high grade, and as you know, really difficult to come by. Yeah. Well, and the funny thing is, like, the 96 W. Dime, and, you know, it is a relatively easy coin to come by. You just buy a 96 Mint set, and you can have one. So, yep, it's cool. That's true. That's cool that they kind of included some coins that, you know, if people were to read the book or listen to this segment, they could... Go out and buy one for 15 bucks. And I like the fact that they they focused on coins that have interesting stories. You know, these, these coins have stories that make them interesting as well as collectible. And all are told in amazing detail and feature bold, full-color photographs. Forwards written by numismatic legends Q. David Bowers and Kenneth Brissett, and a new section that addresses modern coin grading essentials written by NGC chairman Mark Salzberg, give the reader insight from three of numismatic's most experienced and respected minds. A wonderful reference for any modern collector, subjects include types and surface finishes of modern U.S. coins, manufacture and packaging, and differences between varieties and errors. New and experienced collectors will enjoy reading this book and referring to it time and again. It's a coffee table-sized book which makes the photographs large enough for study and lends to hours of enjoyment. And at under $30, it also makes an excellent holiday gift. Huh. Maybe you should get me one for Christmas. Maybe I should. Something that, that we now do, again, on our brand new website is a whole new blog that is dedicated to the coolest things that walk into Matt's shop. And I will tease our listeners by saying that if you look to Instagram, you're going to start seeing pictures on Instagram of cool things, not only that walk into Matt's shop, but cool things that Matt has around the shop yep. and much more picture-oriented stuff. But that's not why we're here. No, that's not why we're here. <laughs> we, 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 we're going to show Instagram some love, though. We are going to show Instagram some love. Maybe, and hopefully maybe some you selfies. guys are going to show us some Instagram love. And we're going to see how fast we can build followers on Instagram. I just want to see how fast why we not? can do it. Let's see what we yeah. can do. So, Matt. Yes, sir. Uh, what was the coolest thing that walked in this week. This is a piece um, that I have never owned before, before uh, this last week, which was kind of cool. Um, it is a Mexican coin, actually. <clears throat> and it was struck, actually, in a period in Mexican coinage where the majority of Mexican coins were actually made out of silver. 
And this is an 1833 Mexico uh, one-half Escudo, which is a really neat coin with a really neat design that, like I said, I have never owned one before. This particular piece was in an NGC MS-63 holder. And uh, if you're not familiar with it, uh, obviously you can go to the website and I will put the pictures up there for you to take a look. Um, it doesn't do that for me, folks. So. No, I don't. I, I like to just <laughs> use my words to describe it to you. Yes. So on the obverse of this coin, you have a hand holding a, how do you say that? Phagrian cap? It's, it's Phrygian. Phrygian, okay. On the obverse, you have a hand holding a, a stick with a, a Phrygian cap on it in front of an open book that says lay inside the book, um, which is Spanish for gold. I believe. <laughs> no. No. No, no. Oh, no, no. That's... Uh, is it L-E-Y? Yeah. Okay. That lay is Spanish word for law. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> uh, so it shows in front of an open book with the word lay in it, which, uh, as Mike has informed me, is a Spanish word for law. <laughs> <laughs> and on the reverse – oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say I could have told you that ahead of time if I'd seen it. Go ahead. Check your... I, I know. I'm just I'm giving you a hard time. So these coins are made out of silver? No, they're gold. Oh, they're gold. They're okay. gold, and they're, they're about the size, a little bit larger than an American seated, uh, seated half dime, but not quite the size of a dime. These are really, really tiny coins. Yeah, it's not a very big coin, uh, and... It's uh, it's very, very crude, which is kind of what I like about it. The fact that it, uh, you know, the lettering doesn't line up, and it's in some places the lettering is mashed together, and in other places there's big spaces in the middle of words. Yeah, it almost looks like an eBay phony. Kind of, but, but this is definitely a legitimate coin that was struck uh, in that period in Mexican history. Because hmm. I, I just did a quick Google search on it. Yeah. And uh, the image I'm looking at has the, uh, what do you call it, the dentals that go around the coin. Mm -hmm. The the dentals don't even go all the way around the coin. Uh, on some examples they do, and some they don't. It, it was just one of those that was struck without a collar, so sometimes you get examples that are not really well-centered. Yeah. This particular one's pretty well-centered, actually, so it, it does have them all the way around. So I've talked about the the obverse with the hand and the Phrygian cap in the book. And then the reverse has what you would typically expect to find on a Mexican coin of that day, <clears throat> which is the Mexican eagle sitting on top of a cactus with a snake in its mouth, um, which has been a symbol of Mexico for as long as, you know... And tequila drinkers everywhere. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, that's been a Mexican symbol for a very, very long time. And then, you know, the coin itself is not struck all that well because, you know, I wouldn't expect it to be in that period. Uh, you think of American coinage from the 1830s. You know, we were just starting to get into the steam press era, uh, so they were still made on screw presses in the American coins. So, obviously, this coin was made on some sort of uh, rudimentary press in Mexico. I like the mint mark on this coin because it's it's a – Two-letter mint mark? Mm -hmm. It's an M-O? Well, it's actually a four-letter mint mark. It's a, oh. it's an M-O-M-J. Ah. So Do you have any idea what that stands for? The, the M-O is Mexico City. Okay. Uh, and then I'm assuming that the M-J is uh, a certain mint in Mexico City. There may have been more than one. Okay. Uh, Michael Jordan mint. <laughs> But it's a it's a really cool coin, and like I said, I have never owned one. I, I've owned a lot of Spanish silver from that era in this kind of grade, this kind of MS-63 type grade. But this is really the first one of these guys that I've owned at this grade, so or in any grade for that matter. But uh, it was definitely something that stood out as being absolutely different from anything else that we bought this week. Yeah, the the lettering that goes around this is really crude, as you, as you had said, because... You know, it's, it's like not all the letters line up on it. It doesn't look, it almost looks like it was typeset. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was def, It was done by hand. I guarantee yeah. you. Yeah. Almost, it, they were likely hand punched into the dies. Right. And, and, and really very rudimentary, as, as you said. And, and it's neat that the design is, is very cool. I like the cap on pole. Which I mean, apparently was a, a very North American thing. Actually, uh, and funny, funny that you, uh, you, you mentioned that it actually goes back to Greek times, but it looks like uh, we and the Mexicans adapted it later. Sure. Well, the the Phrygian cap is supposed to be a symbol for freedom of thought. Mm -hmm. You know, and as as we had just 
you know, basically gotten away from our oppressors and our rulers. You know, we wanted to express freedom of thought. I'm quite certain that in Mexico they were they were kind of trying to symbolize that same thing. <laughs> I, I think it's funny because you have this hand holding the the hat that's supposed to symbolize freedom of thought, but then it's pointing to a book that says law. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I just you know put that out there. Yeah, interesting. Uh, no, that's, that is interesting. And it's a big book too. Yeah, very large. A lot of laws. So so not, not tacos uh, on Wednesday. <laughs> Taco Tuesday. Taco it's Tuesday. always Taco Tuesday. <laughs> so, so this just came strolling into your shop. Yes, uh, a collector had it. Uh, they didn't even call or anything. They just showed up and said, "Hey, I don't want this anymore." So, and this being gold, you said it's about the size of a half dime. It's very small. Yes. What does it weigh? Uh, you know, that's a great question. I don't know that off the top of my head, but not very much is my answer. <laughs> I did a little research because I just got this actually the, the last day that I was in the office before we recorded the show. So <clears throat> I didn't have a lot of time to do research on it, but I did find that uh, this particular coin uh, at NGC, which is who it's certified by, has a population of two, uh, this, wow. this being one of them. And then there are only two coins graded higher, one an MS-64 and one an MS-66. No, 66. Okay. So... This one grades MS-63. Yes. Oh, so I'm likely looking at the slab tag from the coin that walked into your shop. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. So this coin was not bought on weight. It was clearly bought on value. Oh, no, definitely. Yeah, this coin's worth a heck of a lot more than it's just its gold value. Uh, being, okay. Being that in that grade, it's so hard to find, obviously, from the, the population of just two coins and only two more nicer ones. Um, you know, I, I'm guessing, like I said, I didn't have a ton of time to research this coin, um, but I'm guessing the value is somewhere 600 to $750. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah. And uh, what's interesting in looking at some of these Google images is that they kept the same design for quite some time on Mexican gold <laughs> coins. And it did get more refined and it did get, you know, better. Less crude. Better. Yes, much less crude and, and much more, but but essentially the exact same design, huh. which I thought was really interesting. But but to see the 1833, uh, you know, it's it's like the letters reverse direction sometimes. Yeah, you know, it's, so it's it's neat. And I wish I oh yeah, I, wish yeah. I, I forgot to mention Spanish. this. I forgot to mention this as well because uh, the cool part about this particular coin on the reverse, you'll see uh, two sprigs coming out of the bottom. Uh, and in this particular year, they actually reversed the sprigs. So this is the only year that has the 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 leaves like this, uh, with the leaves with the berries on one side and the big leaves on the other side. Uh, in every other year, the leaves are actually reversed, so that the leaves with the berries will be on the left side, and the more broad leaves will be on the right. Now you know that that has to do with heraldry, and it always it always refers to a preference for one over the other. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like they, they call the, the right hand the Dexter and the left hand the Sinister. And I've always kind of found that interesting. I wonder what the – because one of them is, is more than likely Laurel. Mm -hmm. And the other is uh, – God, I, I, mean, I don't <laughs> – yeah, I don't know what to say. But uh, but it, it shows a, a preference – or Olive. There you go. Yeah. That's so it's like one is, is symbolizing peace and one is symbolizing probably knowledge. Yeah, but but this particular year, the die cutters actually switched them uh, intentionally or not. But this was the only year that they did that. Very cool coin. Yeah, I thought so. So it's, it's already graded. Mm -hmm. So what are your plans to do with it? That's a great question. I'll probably be offering it for sale uh, on our new store website, actually. I'm going to do a shameless plug here. but uh, LDRcoins.com? Uh, LDRcoins.com. Within the next two weeks, I'm going to be completely dropping a new entire website with uh, a built-in online store so that you can buy stuff directly from our store, from our website, and some, from... The radio show coins. Some coins that you hear on the show may just end up on that website for sale. So, in more shameless plugs. Yeah, you can own the coolest thing that walked in. That's right, and then you'll have the coolest thing. Yep, you can own it. End shameless plug. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Q 
God, I love the coffin cats. Yeah. I ca- catch Thanks myself bobbing guys. my head. I do. It's like you, you just can't help but headbang to it. Yep. We would like to thank our contributors, the Facebook friends, Twitter followers, even the people that complain, people who follow our blogs, <laughs> people who wrote to ask questions, or people who have in some other way inspired us. Oh, I, I want thanks. to thank the people that uh, that browsed around the new website and left comments. Uh, it shows shows us that you uh, that you're out there and that uh, you're you're finding it relatively easy to navigate the new website. Yes, and feel free. It, you know, we we have purposely allowed you a place to leave comments on this site, unlike our old one. Yeah. You know, so please, we want to us, hear from you. We want to hear from you. Our thanks to the great folks at the American Numismatic Association. We hear from them all the time. We thank them for their support. Visit them at money.org, which is another new website, which is also extremely cool. It is. Very cool. Our thanks to Tony Alvarez and the Tony Alvarez Band. I hope he's enjoying his retirement. For our theme music, visit them at TonyAlvarezBand.com. We'd also like to thank the Coffin Cats for their musical contributions and for just giving us some darn enjoyable bumps. And being some rad dudes. Yeah. Visit them at CoffinCatsRock.com. We'd also like to thank May Otley for our bumpers and her continuing help. And a big thanks to our research assistant, Sam Schaefer. And while those people are important contributors to the show, their importance absolutely pales in comparison to you, our listeners, without whom this entire endeavor would be completely pointless. You are the reason that we continue to bang this thing out, and we love doing it for you. We love every last member of our audience, and we love your contributions even more. Send us your thoughts. Email us at Mike or Matt at CoinShowRadio.com, Mike at CoinShowRadio.com, Matt at CoinShowRadio.com. Or you can also ask us questions. Send a question to questions at CoinShowRadio.com. Uh, there's a link on our website that just says questions at CoinShowRadio.com in the upper left-hand corner. Click on that. It'll pop up an email for you to do it. And you can do that on our brand-new webpage, conveniently located at CoinShowRadio.com. Don't say Yes, there you will find all kinds of new things. Explore it, enjoy it, touch it, love it, leave a my notch monkey, and report back to us. And if you want to see anything that we don't have up, feel free to shoot us an email. We'll do our best to cater to you guys because we, we, we want to make the website the best we can. So We do, and, and we really are always, always receptive of new ideas and new feedback, even if it's just to say you guys suck, shut up. Check out Matt's new gallery of the cool stuff that walks into Matt's shop on CoinShowRadio.com. Feel free to stop by and give him feedback. The pictures can only be described as spectacular. But try not to drool, as this could damage your desk or, worse yet, your mobile device. Like our page on Facebook. Uh, There is a lot more content that we're starting to post to Facebook and to Twitter and to Instagram. So, you know, come and comment on one of our posts, post something of your own, just try and keep it coin related. You can find us by either searching the coin show or coin show radio. Follow us on Twitter. You'll occasionally find some exclusive content there. Well, every time I get crabby or something like that, I <laughs> tend to put it on Twitter. Um, we are at the coin show. You can also listen to our show on Spreaker.com. Just go to www.spreaker.com and search coin show radio. Or you can find our show on players at various internet sites such as Cointalk.com. If you'd like to host a player on your website, just email me, Mike, at CoinShowRadio.com for details. We have a Windows 8 app, and it's available in the Windows 8 phone app store. Download it several hundred times. If you have an Android phone, there's one for you, too. Download it on Amazon.com for only $1.99. Both are bargains for your entertainment dollar and darn fine applications <laughs> and as always our show is available for free on itunes you can download full versions of the show there we urge you to do so and share it with your friends more people continue to find us every single day and wonder why they never listened before be the first among your friends to find the coin show and share it with them and you will be the smart one in the group so for the coin show i'm mike and i'm matt and we'll talk to you next time on the coin show <laughs>
hear that? Yeah. Okay. It's Sounds like a bargain. Seamless. Yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> hey, I screwed up a read. All right. <laughs> Fantastic. A Mint director Snowden believed that the rays were detrimental to die life and the coining. I'm sorry. Could you do that again? I just quacked. <laughs> God. You know, uh, I think that we got the last episode when we did the marathon hour and a half episode. It was like a Jerry Lewis telethon. I think we got a lot of it. A lot of the the pent up coin show out of our system. I think we did. It, it seems like this is is much more back, you know back to normal. <laughs> yes, just typical of what we like to do. Yep. 